Mike, we hear you well. Hello everybody. Hello everybody, this is Margaret Harris in WHO headquarters, Geneva, welcoming you today, October the 12th, 2022, to our WHO global press briefing on health emergencies and other major current health issues. As usual, we will start with opening remarks from our Director General, Dr. Tedros Adnan Ghebreyesus, who will also introduce a special guest. I will then open the floor to questions, and our panel of technical experts both in the room and online will be available to answer your questions. In the room with Dr. Tedros, and I'll go from right to left, starting with Dr. Gaudens Silberschmidt, Health and Multi Director of Health and Multilateral Partnerships, Dr. Maria Van Kerkhove, Technical Lead on COVID-19, of course, Dr. Tedros in the middle. On the other side of Dr. Tedros is Dr. Ibrahim Asosefal, our Assistant Director General, Emergencies Response, Dr. Mariangela Shimao, our Assistant Director General for Access to Medicine and Health Products, and Dr. Rosamund Lewis, Technical Lead on Monkeypox. As always, this will be, uh, we will have simultaneous interpretation uh, in all six UN languages, plus Portuguese and Hindi, and I thank all the interpreters for their great work. Uh, but now, without further ado, I will hand over to Dr. Tedros for his opening remarks. Apologies, there's some echo, so we won't begin quite yet. Toutes nos excuses, il y a un écho dans la salle. Nous allons demander une seconde pour régler les problèmes techniques. So, so we're, we're still, still managing, managing the technical difficulties, and we'll begin as soon as the sound problem has been sorted. I also forgot to mention that we have, as I said, a large number of people, a large number of experts online, including Dr. Mike Ryan, our Executive Director for Emergencies for the World Health Emergencies Program. And he's joining us from Uganda, where a really important meeting on um, the Ebola situation is going on down there. And uh, so, of course, if there's interest, um, you've got uh, the latest news from Dr. Ryan. I hope that this situation has improved. I'm talking about the echo. Okay, we can go ahead. Apologies for the interruption and the delays, but now Dr. Tedros will begin his opening remarks.
Thank you. Thank you, Margarita. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. First to Uganda, where WHO is continuing to support the government to respond to an outbreak of Ebola disease in five districts. So far, there are 54 confirmed and 20 probable cases with 39 deaths and 14 people have recovered. More than 660 contacts are currently under active follow-up. Our primary focus now is to support the government of Uganda to rapidly control and contain this outbreak, to stop it spreading to neighboring districts and neighboring countries. This morning, I addressed a meeting in Uganda on the outbreak attended by the Prime Minister, the Minister of Health, and health ministers from several neighboring countries. I welcome the Prime Minister's commitment to controlling the outbreak and for engaging Uganda's neighbors. Dr. Mike Ryan is on the ground in Uganda and can say more later. Now to Haiti, where we're deeply concerned about the outbreak of cholera in the capital, Port-au-Prince, and surrounding areas. According to the Ministry of Public Health and Population, as of last Saturday, there were 224 suspected cases of cholera and 16 deaths. One quarter of suspected cases are among children aged under five years. On Sunday, the Ministry also confirmed a cholera outbreak in the National Pensionary of Port-au-Prince with 39 suspected cases and nine deaths. The situation is evolving rapidly, and it's possible that earlier or additional cases have not been detected. The surveillance mechanism set up by the Haitian government with the support of WHO and other partners is operating under extremely difficult circumstances. The affected areas are very insecure, and controlled by gangs, which makes it very difficult to collect samples and delays laboratory confirmation of cases and deaths. In addition, fuel shortages are making it harder for health workers to get to work, causing health facilities to close and disrupting access to health services for people who live in some of the most deprived communities. WHO is working with the Ministry of Health and our partners to coordinate the response, including for surveillance, case management, water and sanitation, vaccination, and community engagement. But to bring this outbreak under control, we need secure access to the affected areas. Now to Pakistan. Last week, I said that Many more people than died in the floods could die from disease in the coming weeks and months. There is now a malaria outbreak in 32 districts, while the incidence of cholera, dengue, measles, and diphtheria is also increasing in flood-affected districts. We expect the situation to continue to deteriorate, but so far, international support has not been at the scale or speed needed. Trillions of dollars are being poured into fighting wars around the world. We continue to ask international donors to invest in saving lives in Pakistan. Tomorrow, the Emergency Committee on COVID-19 will hold its regular quarterly meeting in accordance with the international health regulations. Clearly, we're in a very different situation now to where we were when the committee recommended that I declare a public health emergency of international concern more than 22 months ago. We have all the tools we need to end the emergency in every country, but the pandemic is not over and there is much more work to be done. WHO will brief the committee on the current situation globally and present our concerns about the continuing risks to the world's population with large vaccination gaps, reduced surveillance, 
low rates of testing and sequencing, and uncertainties about the potential impact of current and future variants. I look forward to receiving the committee's recommendations on monkeypox. More than 70,000 cases have now been reported to WHO with 26 deaths. Globally, cases are continuing to decline, but in the past 21 country, but in the past 21 weeks, countries reported an increase in cases, mostly in the Americas, which accounted for almost 90% of all cases reported that week. Once again, we caution that a declining outbreak can be the most dangerous outbreak because it can tempt us to think that the crisis is over and to let down our guard. That's not what WHO is doing. We're continuing to work with countries around the world to increase their testing capacity and to monitor trends in the outbreak. We're concerned about reports of cases in Sudan, including in refugee camps near the border with Ethiopia. Like COVID-19, monkeypox remains a public health emergency of international concern, and WHO will continue to treat it as such. Finally, more than a decade ago, I was invited to join a committee that was setting up a new health conference in Germany called the World Health Summit. Since then, the World Health Summit has gone from strength to strength and is now one of the most important events on the global health calendar. For the first time this year, WHO is the official co-organizer of the World Health Summit. Over three days, thousands of leaders from public health, government, civil society, academia, youth, industry, and parliaments will gather to discuss the most pressing issues in global health. We encourage all journalists around the world to follow the discussions from Sunday to Tuesday at worldhealthsummit.org. It's now my honor to introduce the president of the World Health Summit and my friend, Professor Axel Pris. Axel, thank you so much for joining us today and you have the floor. Yeah, um, Pedros, I would like to give the thank back to you because you were uh, the person initiating together with Detlef Ganten and others the World Health Summit, which uh, aims to serve global health by bringing people together from very different sectors, regions, and viewpoints to attack, as you say, the most pressing uh, questions of uh, global health today. And from your uh, initiating talk, it's quite clear that we have a lot of crises and uh, topics to address. Most um, visible at the moment is probably the COVID crisis, but we will also have to look into other uh, topics like the effect of climate change, the uh, lacking investment for health and well-being, which you also addressed, um, the digital transformation, food systems, and the relation between global health and peace. And this will all be done or addressed at the uh, World Health Summit uh, starting on Sunday in uh, about 60 sessions and uh, Dr. Tedros will be present in uh, a number of sessions. Uh, I read 10 sessions, which will be a lot of work to do. And uh, we, we will have very many high-ranking government officials, but also people, uh, high-ranking people from science and industry and from civil society. And as Dr. Tedros already said, this meeting is a... Uh, meeting in presence in Berlin, but it is also a meeting which is digitally uh, available all over the world for free. And for us, that's uh, really very relevant um, because the problems of global health can only be addressed if we work together as a family of nations and um, try to overcome 
local, too local and too national views, which uh, uh, are really an impediment for tackling the pressing global health questions. Thank you very much, uh, my friend, Dr. Tedros, and um, we are all looking forward to a very stimulating meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Axel. Thank you so much indeed for joining again. And thank you for your leadership. Margarita, back to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros. Uh, I will now open the floor to questions. Um, as you know, we've got a lot of people online. Please keep your questions short and please name your outlet. Uh, and we will ensure that you get, if we do not have someone to answer your question, which would be surprising, we have such a large panel, please, we, we will, you can address your questions to media inquiries. Uh, the first question goes to Helen Branswell. Uh, Helen, could you please unmute yourself and ask your question? Hi. Thank you very much, Margaret. It's Helen Branswell from STAT. Um, I, I think this me question would probably go to Mike, uh, given that he's in Kampala. I'm wondering if WHO has concerns about the way um, Uganda is handling this outbreak. Is it accepting all the help it's being offered? Is it following up on um, suspected or, or probable cases as aggressively as it needs to, to get this under control? Thank you. Thank you, Helen. While we're getting Mike, uh, oh, it sounds like Mike has been able to join. Otherwise, I'll ask Dr. Fowl. No? Okay, over to you, Dr. Ryan. Thanks, Margaret. And uh, I, just checking, verifying you can hear me. Very well, and we can see you well too. <laughs> nice to see you. Okay, uh, that's great. I, um, I first of all, it's it, it, it's a wonderful uh, opportunity to be here at this interministerial meeting where so many countries in the region have come together to collectively address the the risks posed by uh, by Ebola. By Ebola. Uh, I have returned from the field. I was at Uganda yesterday and Madudu, uh, and got a chance to see on the ground the the work that was being done by the clinical teams, the nursing teams, the ambulance teams, uh, by our colleagues and partners in MSF and constructing and supporting the running of uh, isolation facilities and the increasing activity around surveillance and community engagement. Uh, the uh, I think it's fair to say that the Ugandan government is completely activated, the personal leadership shown by the minister here today, the prime minister here today. We've just lost you, Mike. Uh, we can see, but we can't hear you. Uh, we might just, uh, would you like to make some additional remarks, Dr. Fowle? Um, thank you, Margaret. And I think this is an important question from Ellen. Mike was just responding after his visit to the field. And as WHO, we always recommend to countries to consider probable cases as if there were confirmed cases because we cannot miss the link on the transmission chain. So it's very important to make sure that we have quality investigation and identification and contact about around probable cases to make sure that we can understand the full dynamic of the transmission. And it will also help communities to understand that uh, we need to be more alert because if you have more alert from the community, you know, from dead bodies on people presenting symptoms, we'll avoid having a number of problem cases without full information on what happened around them. So I believe although, you know, in the, some of the report, the highlight is on confirmed case, but Uganda is considering all probable cases to make sure that the action are comprehensive in terms of IPC, in terms of safe and dignified burial, and also in terms of contact identification and follow-up. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Fowler. And I think we've got Mike, Dr. Mike Ryan back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'll let you finish. We but I don't know, again, can you hear me? I'm going to leave my um, video off, if you don't mind. I think the connection is rather challenged. Can you hear me? Yeah, the voice. Voice is very good, okay. nice and clear. Okay, okay, and I, I'm sure Sose has gone over this, uh, but certainly the the leadership shown by the minister and all the ministers and, and director generals for health have joined us here. 
Kampala today shows how not only Uganda, but the whole region is activated in response to Ebola. Um, this is not the old way of responding. This is a new way of responding, led by countries, led by ministries of health, supported by international partners. This is what the world wants. The world wants responsible governments reacting and acting in response to these events and leveraging the international support they need. We need more international support for the government here and the surrounding governments in terms of preparedness. We need to activate the surveillance system more at the local level. We need more alerts. We need more community engagement. We need better infection prevention and control in private and public health care facilities. Um, we need to do the necessary testing of drugs and vaccines, and that's currently been planned and is underway already for, for some of the, for, of the antivirals and monoclonals. So we are seeing good progress, but, and the minister said this herself today, it was very important that we are not confident. Ebola brings surprises, infectious diseases bring surprises, and she and her team are, are not in any way underestimating the challenge that the, that this outbreak represents. So um, I have confidence that, that the right things are being done, but we need more scale-up. We need more support for that scale-up. Um, and uh, again, it's reassuring to see the countries in the region coming around together. It's also important that countries, when they are transparent and countries engage, that we don't see punishment for that. So I would hope that governments around the world will see this engagement in the region as a positive development in containing Ebola. Uh, and that will react appropriately to that, seeing the the benefits of this kind of inter-country engagement uh, and the response of the Ugandan authorities. So, um, yes, Ellen, it's uh, like every time in Ebola, it is difficult to get everything right instantly, but the pieces are coming together. The Central Public Health Lab is working well now uh, in terms of diagnostics. The time to diagnosis is now reduced from four to, about to about four to six hours from more than 48 hours before. The time between onset and admission of cases has dropped from an average of seven days. It's now down to three to four days. It's not good enough yet. But we're each and every parameter, we're making some progress. The thing that concerns me most overall is that we're not generating enough alerts at community level, and we need to focus on that in the coming days. Over. Thank you very much, Dr. Mike Ryan. Uh, the, the next question goes to Sarah Jerving from DevEx. So, Sarah, could you unmute yourself and ask your question? Uh, thank you very much for taking my question. Um, can you talk more about the links between climate change and cholera? Um, what should the world expect to see in terms of cholera outbreaks in the coming years? And should management of cholera change because of this uptick in cases? Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Dr. Sose Fahl, we'll, we'll start and we may supplement online as well. Um, thank you very much. Uh, no. As we can see already, the climate stress is, you know, creating more complex and humanitarian crisis. Right now, we are talking about 330 million people in need for humanitarian assistance, while the projection was around 274 million for 2022. So we have, you know, an increased number of people of need for access to basic services like water sanitation, and so on. And if you look at the situation in the Horn of Africa, in the Sahel, in Pakistan, you can see already the impact of climate change. As we always say, that climate change is a public health crisis also. And uh, as DG said, and, uh, it's really important to see that all these people have difficult access to water and sanitation because of the climate stress. And uh, we will see more and more, you know, cholera, outbreak happening and right now we are talking about 28 countries reporting cholera cases and 11 of them are new in 2022. So the climate change, you know, associated with the issue of security, humanitarian crisis will continue increasing the risk of cholera for millions of people. And uh, we are really seeing cholera as an old disease, but it's already a new threat. So we need to treat cholera as like all the new diseases we are, we are dealing with. And uh, the, the pressure we are having on community like oral, oral vaccine and other communities is so huge. And, uh, and we are getting a lot of stress to make sure that the people who are in this difficult condition have access to safe to have access to oral vaccine. And uh, this is going to increase. And we call on manufacturer, on donors to really prioritize you know, investment and cholera to save life. Thank you. 
Thank you, Dr. Fahl. And I believe we have Dr. Philippe Barbosa. Philippe, do you ha have anything to supplement? Looks like Philippe is not online. Okay. So the next question. Oh, there I, he is. <laughs> yes, yes, I am. Sorry. So uh no, I think the the, the, the response was uh, was comprehensive. The um the 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 only thing I, I, I would add is the the, uh, the impact also the the one last year and the one coming for uh, very likely this year on the uh, eastern part of Africa due to the uh, uh, projected La Nina uh, phenomenon. So uh, it's really uh, a game changer on the cholera dynamic. So um, we, we we cannot address more specific questions, but uh, cholera is really changing the dynamic of the, the, the climate change is changing the dynamic of cholera, and we need to pay a lot of attention to that. Over. Thank you very much, Dr. Fall and Dr. Barbosa. Uh, the next question goes to Ian Wafula from BBC Focus on Africa. Ian, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Um, uh, thank you very much. My question is to Dr. Mariangelo Simao about the uh, situation in the Gambia, about the cough syrup that led to the, potentially led to the death of about 66 children. The first question I'd just like to ask is, how did you reach the conclusion as per your alert last week that uh, the syrup might have possibly gone to other regions or countries uh, through the black market? And do we know what regions we're talking about? And then just quickly, the Indian authorities today stopped the pharmaceutical company from producing the cough syrups. What's your reaction to this? And are you concerned that the syrups might have actually uh, already been uh, in the market and are still in circulation? Thank you, Ian, for the three questions in one. Let me see if I can respond to everything. Uh, First of all, it's uh, related to how did we reach the conclusion that there could be a link. First, uh, I think it's very important to say that there is a very in-depth investigation of these deaths, this very sad occurrence of these deaths in the Gambia by the government of the Gambia, by international partners, including WHO, on the ground supporting the full investigation. During the, the course of these investigations, we were the government of Gambia started to collect medicines that have been used by different uh, uh, children who had uh, who were hospitalized. And WHO does what it usually does when there is a suspect of uh, of, engage, of the involvement of the medicines in in a health occurrence. And WHO sends these samples of the older several what twenty three different samples were sent to our reference labs. One of them is in Switzerland, and the other one is in France. And then we had uh, the unfortunate findings of the four pediatric formulations that had contaminations with two products that are old products. They have been involved in other contaminations and led to, to serious health problems and deaths since 1930. It's a very well-known history. Uh, the the, the diethylene glycol, we call it DEG, and the ethylene glycol, we call it E.g., and they should never be in anything that human beings ingest. You know, so this is, so I'm just trying to separate because the investigations into the deaths, they continue, but once we detect these products in a, in a medicine or something that people will take on and will ingest, they should be banned from the market. So what we have so far, we, we the normal procedure, WHO has regular procedures for this. One of them is the global medical alert that has a few aims to, for example, to inform uh, national regulatory authorities when we notice problems with a product and to also inform the public. And also, we have to raise the alert in terms of that this, this product may be circulated in other countries. The information we received from the drug controller in India was that these batches were manufactured exclusively for the Gandhi, but we don't rule out the possibility that through unregulated markets that it has reached out to other countries. And just la la lastly, add that uh, several countries in the African region have issued their own own alert and are 
proactively doing surveillance, trying to identify if these products are in their market. And that's the right thing to do. Last thing is that, let me say that we are working very closely with the Indian authorities for the full investigation into the manufacturing process itself and the, the ways these products reach the market, right? So the, the distribution and the manufacturing. And WHO did recommend to the, the, the drug control, controller in India to suspend the, the manufacturing in this, the plants that were involved in this. Uh, incident, and we hear that this has been done, and that the, the the production is suspended. I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Dr. Shamal. Uh, the next question will go to uh, Christian Ulrich from DPA. Christian, please uh, unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you, Margaret. This is Christiana with the German Press Agency. My question is ahead of the uh, emergency committee meeting on COVID later this week. I hope maybe, Maria, you could lay the land a little bit on uh, on, on what's ahead. Does that make sense? Uh, I, I know that the committee is going to come up with its recommendation and it's not WHO who decides, but from a WHO perspective, does it make sense to keep this as an emergency of international concern? Or would it not make sense to, to move to a new phase now? Uh, everyone has been alerted. Everyone is aware of this problem. What would be the, the uh, how would that make, uh, how, how would it be important to keep this as an uh, emergency of international concern? Why would, should that not be um, withdrawn now. Sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Christian. Dr. Van Kerkhove will, will answer your question. So thanks very much for the question. So we won't preempt what the emergency committee will debate and decide and advise to the director general um, tomorrow. But what we will, as the secretariat, will be laying out is what is happening with COVID-19 right now. Um, given that we're in the third year of this pandemic, the virus is circulating at a, an incredibly intense level around the world. In the last week alone, we've had more than 3 million reported cases, and we know that's an underestimate because surveillance has changed, testing has changed, reporting has changed. Um, so we don't have a good idea. We don't have a good, a clear picture of how much actually this virus is circulating around the world. On the other hand, what we are seeing is a reduced impact of SARS-CoV-2 infections in people because of the use of available tools, life-saving tools like diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. The challenge that we face right now are twofold. One is that we haven't utilized these tools most effectively in all countries around the world. We have not reached the vaccination level coverage in the most at-risk populations in all countries of the world. If you look at the proportion of the people who have been vaccinated who are over the age of 60, who have underlying conditions, our frontline workers, we haven't reached the targets of 100% in every country. And that's due to a lack of access, it's due to a lack of the implementation of, these, of the use of these vaccines in countries and many challenges that we face, including misinformation and disinformation about these products. On the other hand, we also have an uncertainty about this virus going forward. The virus is spreading at, a, at an intense level. We are tracking currently more than 300 sublineages of Omicron, which is the variant of concern that is dominant worldwide. Most of these subvariants are BA.5, sublineages of BA.5 or BA.2, and our ability to track, to trace, to assess these variants is reducing over time because of changes in surveillance, because of changes in sequencing. And so what we don't know is, the, is how this virus will continue to change. We know it will change. We expect future variants to be more transmissible. We expect there to be some further immune escape from variants that will continue to circulate, but we can have some kind of effect on the impact of this virus going forward if we use these tools most effectively. Now, people, countries are certainly in a different stage as they were in the beginning. The world is in a much better place in dealing with COVID as we go forward, but we're not quite living with this virus as, uh, we're not managing it as well as we possibly could. We need to live with COVID-19 responsibly. We need to save lives, as many lives as we can, as as everywhere in the world, not just in high income countries, but in all countries of the world while we live our lives. So we are working with member states right now, every member state of the world, all over the world, to optimize the response in this third year. 
to adjust the strategies related to surveillance, related to infection prevention and control, related to vaccination, risk communication and community engagement so that we have the appropriate use of public health and social measures like masking, distancing, improving ventilation, cleaning your hands, um, making sure that we address misinformation and disinformation, which is rampant worldwide and has an effect on the life-saving tools that actually exist. And we need to further work on research and development so that we continue to develop more vaccines, um, potentially vaccines that look at infection as well as transmission in addition to saving lives. So <coughs> there's a lot more to do. Um, and we, as the World Health Organization, will continue to work with all member states to optimize that response, calibrate the response in the context of all of the other health emergencies that you're asking about here today at this press conference, of health emergencies as well as non-health emergencies. So it's a complex picture out there, um, but we have been very clear, the Director General has been very clear that this is not over and that there is much more work that we need to do. Thank you very much, Dr. Van Kerkhoff. Uh, the next question goes to Nina Larson from AFP. Nina, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank, thank you very much for taking my question. Um, I wanted to come back on um, uh, Helen's question earlier about Ebola in Uganda. I was wondering, um, Mike mentioned that um, there's an issue with generating enough alerts uh, in the community. I was wondering what the challenges are, what the problems are with doing that, and if uh, health workers on the ground are meeting uh, pushback from the community and uh, how you're working to respond to that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we might uh, check whether Dr. Ryan's still online. Um, I'm here. Great. Over I'm to here you. If you can hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Yeah, we, Beautifully. Uh, we got. We got. We got. We MacGyvered a solution with, with duct tape and plastic uh, rubber bands here, so we have a new connection, so I hope it's better. Um, that's a good question. I, I, I don't think there's any more resistance than, or difficulty than you find in, in, in any situation. This is a local, rural community. Um, there are some traditional beliefs uh, in that community. Uh, there is a huge commitment to family. There's a huge commitment to community. There's a huge focus on burial rights and and, and 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 we've seen this in many cases i think the uh, in general the, the the local government and the local system is is reacting well there are some specific communities um, there are local settled communities there are migra migratory or displaced or refugee communities there are some communities that work around gold mining so it's not a completely homogenous group there are different groups within society in that part of uganda and we re need to reach the, all of them so first of all we need to be able to reach all communities and the government are really really trying hard with that our colleagues in unicef and the red cross movement are also working with us with us on that uh, the other is really having engagement not just uh, uh, risk communication where we tell people what to do or how to avoid risk but having a true participation and engagement in the process so the communities uh, are not only welcoming the response but participating and shaping the response and that they're also seeing benefits of participation and the response like improvements to the primary health care system investment in the village health work network uh, there's a fantastic network of village health workers they need to be invested being uh, that's currently happening um, and the government is really scaling up its investment in, in that group. So I think it is moving, um, but like in any situation, uh, we need to really commit to the concept of true community engagement, which is a two-way conversation, a two-way process, not a one-way process. And I believe that is really starting to happen. Um, again, it takes time to, to bring a response to scale. Every country learned this in COVID, and nobody got full max when it comes to responding to the first weeks in an epidemic where things are not straightforward, uh, there are, um, uh, so I learned to be humble uh, in the face of epidemics. Uh, and I believe what I've seen on the ground is that the, the main components of the response are, are coming together. Uh, I've seen that there are improvements occurring, but there are still gaps. So from that perspective, Putting the community at the centre of this response is something that is in the minister's mind and mind of the whole government. Uh, delivering and executing that is is going to require prolonged investment in those communities, and, and it is the centre of Ebola control to have that focus on communities, a patient centre focus, and uh, as I said, other partners like UNICEF, like. Uh, 
the Red Cross movement and other NGOs are working also uh, with us on, on, on trying to drive that. Thank you, Dr. Ryan. I think that's you finished. Yes, uh, you, your your intervention finished. I should say. Uh, we're coming to the end. I apologise for the technical difficulties that we had at the beginning, uh, but we're we're now running out of time. So I will now go over to Dr. And I want to thank the media for such really good questions covering the big issues that we're facing this at present. Uh, but I will now ask Dr. Axel, uh, Professor Axel Priest, if you'd like to make some final remarks. Uh, it was again very clear that uh, we have a lot of problems all around the world where we need to pull together um, all our efforts to, to tackle them. And um, I will just give one um, hint to what will happen at the World Health Summit. Uh, in, in one area here. There will be a keynote on investing in a polio-free future for more resilient health systems. It's a polio pledging event and, and a very, very relevant event where Dr. Tedros will speak, um, among others, and um, also Christopher Elias from the Gates Foundation. And I think these are the... Um, uh, kind of mechanisms how we can make the world a safer place. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I'll now hand over to Dr. Tedros for his final remark. Thank you. Um, first, I would like to thank uh, my friend, Professor Axel Pries, uh, for joining us today as, as a guest. Uh, and also inviting once again journalists to uh, follow the uh, World Health Summit um, uh, next week. Um, and I would also like uh, to thank the uh, community, the uh, media community for joining us uh, today. And uh, see you next time.